I smuggle words from this punchline into the setup so it's economical on the punchline because you don't want a, a long wordy punchline. It's like being hit in the head with the Rubik cube and you're being asked to solve it and also it can have a bad rhythm. So sounds like your language is a lot easier for comedy. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I get it. The person you heard in the beginning is Adam Bloom, a British stand-up comedian who's a comedian with a extremely long career spanning several decades, and he's got a lot of writing credits. And, and most importantly, for the context of this podcast, he's the author of the book Finding Your Comic Genius. Now, if you're a long-time listener of this show, you'll notice that uh, this episode will be in English, but uh, half of it will be done in, in a Finnish accent. And if this is your first time listening, you're probably wondering why anyone would name their podcast with a vowel soup such as Takaisin Kirjoituspöydälle. That's uh, finished for Back to the Writing Board, and it doesn't quite translate properly, but please assume that the name's witty and snappy and incredible in all possible ways, but in Finnish. So the reason I reached out to Adam is that I read his book and uh, I was absolutely blown away. I've read a lot about this uh, subject and I've made like nearly 50 episodes of the podcast about comedy writing. And I gotta say, this book is the one single greatest thing I've read about this subject. So when I when I read it and and noticed that, oh, this guy is something different, I, I, I just had to email him. And luckily enough, he said that, oh, oh yeah, yes, this sounds good. Definitely coming to your podcast, which was a pleasant surprise to me. I was thinking that, oh, he's somewhere real far and, and like really hard to get to, but no, he turned out to be a really nice guy. Let's roll the theme music and let Adam shower us with his comedy writing knowledge. So welcome. The Finnish stand-up comedy audience might not be entirely familiar with the UK scene, so let's give them a bit of a background. Who are you? Well, my name's Adam Bloom. I've been a stand-up comedian for 30 years, and I've been full-time for 28 years. And I recently wrote a book called Finding Your Comic Genius that is making, I, I, I think, a good impression on a lot of comedians. Oh, yes, indeed. That's a major splash that it's made in the comedy circles in, in Finland. I've been talking with lots of comedians about your book and they're all like just blown away. Like it's completely different and it's articulating a lot of stuff so well. That's, that's not been said in any other book or presentation or anywhere. So let's go into, into the book soon enough, but let's give a bit more background. How would you describe your stand-up history in brief? I was 23 when I started and I was very driven and I I was very ambitious and I, I I started to do very well very quickly. I was getting on national television two years in and then five years in I could do a national tour, small, you know, small theatres, but still. And then maybe maybe seven years into doing television, it started to fizzle out. I wasn't flavor of the month for long. Ooh. So I think that my career television wise faded out but then radio 4 came along and gave me three series so there's always been something you know then i started to ghostwrite for a lot of people and now i've written a book so there's always been something going on but with regard to fame and fortune i kind of in my 30 year graph i peaked five six years in well let's hope this this one's going to be your second peak because the book is doing incredibly well so now you're this number one authority on on how to do comedy. <laughs> the thing is that for comedians listening, you know, your career can be a combination of people coming to you or you going to people. No one asked me to write a book. I wrote a book. Whereas when you're doing stand up and you're young and you're hungry and you go to the Edinburgh Festival, people come to you. Melbourne Comedy Festival comes to you. Just for Laughs comes to you. Radio 4 comes to you. Then you get into your 40s and people aren't coming to you anymore. <laughs> Because I was so successful so quickly, and then it fizzled out over a few years, basically television dropped me. It, 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 and that's the, that's the blunt way of putting it. Because I was a very good stand-up comedian, but I wasn't very good on panel shows. 
So they'd go, you're a great comedian. We love your Edinburgh show. Come and sit on a, at a desk 20 foot away from the front row with much bigger names than you, either side of you, competing for the attention. And it's hard, you know? You've gone from the fastest kid in the race to the slowest kid in the race. And it's a different race. It's an egg and spoon race suddenly. And you're not, you're not used to running with a spoon on an egg on a spoon. So I hope you have the egg and spoon race in Finland, do you? We do. <laughs> so when, when things sl slowed down, I kind of, no matter how much success I had as a comedian, I always was living in the shadow of my own success, which is very dangerous because you can look back on your life and go, yeah, I had a good career. You know, I've, I've sustained a living for 28 years. But then you can go, yeah, but 1999, I was touring. I can't tour now. Not enough people know me now. So then you can feel like you're not successful. You know, it, the paradox of success is that the higher you go, the further you can fall. And because my hype happened very early on, I kind of almost feel like I did my first two-hour gig in 1999. And my next three gigs are going to be 20-minute sets in a club. I'm doing a, I'm doing a 30-minute set in Utrecht, actually, this, this weekend. But, but 30 minutes is still a quarter of what I was doing at my maximum 25 years ago. So I sometimes feel like, you know, it all happened a bit too quickly. I didn't handle the pressure well. You know, doing several TV shows a year and having to write, do different material in each one when you haven't got that much material and then suddenly repeating material. So, you know, looking back on it, it all happened very quickly. But I'm happy because I'm still doing what I love. I don't need that much money and I don't care about fame. So I'm, I'm doing what I love. You know, I, I kind of measure success by the respect of your peers. So, you know, it's hard to imagine, but there, one comedian can sell a stadium out. There's another comedian who's struggling to pay his tax bill and he's more respected than the stadium one. I mean, there's no, there's no one who fills stadiums who isn't very talented. That's impossible. It's not the music industry. But the point is that, you know, I measure success by, by the quality of what I do and my peers reminding me that it's good. So it just doesn't pay a mortgage, unfortunately. If you fill stadiums and you're not good, you're not going to do that for a long time because there's lots of comedians that are now coming up with their incredible promotion machines on TikTok and, and so on. But the audience can see through that because if you don't have the material to back that up, that TikTok fame, yeah. like it's not going to last. That's happening a lot. But my point is you can fill a stadium in England and be a brilliant comedian in the public eyes, but not be a comedian's comedian. You know, I'm a big fan of Jim Jeffries and Jim Jeffries sells stadiums out and comics turn up to watch him. You know, you want that. You want both. You know, if you've got a stadium with a 20 comedians in the green room, that's great, right? That's like credibility. That's, that's the same thing that's happening in music. There are musicians that are like incredibly successful, but no musician shows up to listen, listen to them. Right. It, I mean, it depends what you want, right? It, you know, the, the public decide what's, what's best, uh, but they don't know what's best in the sense that they haven't got an acquired taste. You know, we can see the tricks. A comedian's comedian, somebody who's come up with their own methods and their own patterns. And when you can see two punchlines ahead of somebody, you're like, well, you're not a comedian's comedian. The public can't see through this because they don't watch enough comedy. Yeah, like it's, it's horrible when you realize that, oh, I'm actively ruining this gig for me, like seeing the punchlines, like figuring out what's, where's he going to go next. That's horrible. There's one comedian, I'm two punchlines ahead of him, two punchlines ahead of him, and he's a multimillionaire. You know, not every, a very good friend of mine's a magician, and he was just saying today to me, there's a, a, a flourish when you're, you're shuffling the cards in a very fancy way. And um, he said, a magician friend of his, who's very, very, very good, said, are you still doing that old move? That's so dated. And he went, I'm not doing it for magicians. I'm doing it for the public. The public have never seen it before. He goes, duk, 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 with his cards, they spin around his hands. It looks like a, a, a visual a, a delight for the eyes. But the magicians have moved on to a different one. Well, we don't know that. We just see a magician doing something really cool. So th that kind of snobbery, I'm guilty of that snobbery in comedy because I, I don't like formulaic comedy. I couldn't do formulaic comedy. I, I couldn't live with myself doing something that simplistic. One of your strengths is that you're able to write for other people, which is I highly sympathize with because that's my biggest claim to fame too, because I'm not the performer type, I'm the writer type. Right. So... What have you done on, on the writing for other people front? I understood that this is exceptionally strong for you. Yeah. So before the book came out, I'd written for 50 people. And now the book's out, I've written for 62 people. 
Wow. Yeah. It, may, it was just over 50, actually. I didn't have the exact number, but it was just over 50. But I've written for another 12 people since the book's come. It's great because people have contacted me, in, even t- two jobs in the States. You know, I'm writing on Zoom. Um, and that's wonderful. You know, the, the, the spin-off of the book is as lucrative as the book itself because I'm doing, I'm doing two writing jobs a week at the moment. I've understood that there are like big, big, big names that you cannot mention out loud. I can't yeah, mention, no. But no, but one of, them, one of them's got an Oscar nomination, though. That's quite rare. Like, I don't have any Oscar nom- nominations to myself. Again, we're back to the, the, the respect to your peers. You might be writing for somebody who's a hugely huge... Like my favorite comedian, Sean Locke. And um, if Sean Locke asked me to write from him, I would be dancing around my living room for an hour. Um, he died, sadly, two years ago, but nonetheless, if he was alive. So, you know, it's not necessarily about the... the, um, the, the, the person with the Oscar I write for is extraordinarily gifted and extraordinarily original. So I am very proud of that. But my point is, you might be writing for someone who you have as, as much as... It's, again, it's, it's, it's how you, you, know, you feel. I, I am very, very, very honored to write for this person. I've written for them 29 times, ranging from tiny jobs, a couple of hours here or there, last minute. If you've got an idea for this, bang, 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 type it out, knock it off. Well, it's funny because I did the Comedians Comedian podcast in 2012, the first time I did. I've done it twice. And the first question was, do you have to be a comedian? And I immediately answered yes. And then by the end of the interview, I changed my mind because writing for someone is so rewarding when you see the laugh happen that as long as I'm being creative, I'm happy. So the buzz of a gig is instant. You just go, say the joke, bang. Whereas you write something, you th- hope it works, you see it a week later, a month later, and and then you see it works. So really, although I love the fix of a gig, if I was constantly writing and seeing stuff working, as long as I'm being creative, I'm happy. Uh, I would probably miss performing, no doubt, because of the adrenaline. But if you if you if you're a creative person and you're being paid to be creative, and the outcome is something beautiful, that's probably enough you're seeing your work come to life you don't have to be holding the microphone when someone says your joke i heard that there's a famous line about like you talking about comedy and and about your girlfriend yes yeah, so um i only ever said this once in 1999 in melbourne in australia it's genuinely the most quoted line i've ever said what well, the jokes i've said hundreds of times on stage on television on radio and yet this is the line that gets quoted the most i've only ever said it once the, the, i'll give you the short version I was obsessed with comedy as a young comedian. A girlfriend said, can you try not to talk about comedy for 20 minutes? I said, yeah, can I have a light at 18? Yes, indeed. And, um, and that made the book um, uh, because there was a chapter on, there's 30, 32 chapters, 32 cartoons. And I had a light, lightning, light bulb moment. I went, how, oh, my God, there's a chapter on applying everything we've discussed so far. There's a pit stop half of the book and list of, all the things you could do to one routine. Let's just stop a minute and look, because I'm terrified of people reading the whole book and not doing anything. You know, you, you, it's like reading a dictionary. You, you learn 100,000 words, but you wouldn't be using 100,000 words. So halfway through the book, there's a pit stop, and the, the cartoon for that is the couple in bed, because there's a running thing. There's a young male comedian reading my book in bed, and his girlfriend's got a head against the pillow, and she's completely exhausted by him. And so that it was perfect. And that I had that before the... I didn't create that situation with them in bed for that joke. They were already in bed for <laughs> seven cartoons. And then I just went, oh my God, <laughs> this is perfect. She's bored. It's meant to be, right? It, it was just one of those puzzles that fitted into place perfectly. He's enthusiastic. She's bored. And if he's reading a book and, and she says that to him, he's not even looking up from the book. So you know, she's going, try not to talk about comedy for 20 minutes. And he's looking down at this book with his eyes lit up with excitement. He goes, can I light, light to 18? He's not, he's, visually he even makes it, Better because it was never a visual joke; it was always just word of mouth, right? Hearsay. So yeah, suddenly having it as a cartoon was great because it it took um it took twenty four years for that joke to exist. <laughs> yeah, about the book, and uh, I've read it, and it's stellar. Like it's incredible. It's it's undeniable. So your book is named uh, "Finding Your Comic Genius." So what is it all about? I've been told by several people over the years, you know, you should really write a book. You've got a very analytical way of explaining comedy. And I always thought, yeah, but it's not a market for an advanced book because there are already 30 plus how to do it books for beginners. There are more people 
wanting to do comedy or who are new to comedy than full-time comedians. So I thought, well, if I, if I wrote a book, it would have to be different. There's no point in me doing a basic book because I'm not using my full skills there. So I thought, well, the only book I can write is an advanced book on stand-up for people who already do it. There's no market for that. Then Amazon came along and self-publishing came along. And then I started to think, wait a minute, there's 400 professional comedians in England. Then you go all the other countries in the world. America's got more. Then you've got the part-time comedians who would be able to follow it. And this is global. And I, and I don't need a publisher. And then I thought, well, if I make sure I talk to the reader like they could be new, and I explain everything. So I don't do the basic setup punchline, all formulas of jokes and whatever classic way to, I skip all of that. I go straight to the advance, but I do it in a way that a beginner, someone who hasn't even been on stage yet, could absorb, provided they're intelligent. So if anything felt complicated, I, I ran it by my 80 year old mother and she once wrote back and said, you lost me towards <laughs> the end. So I, I, admit, I admit it once, but we're talking about 20 times. So every time I sent something to my mum, she went, yep, completely get it. And I was like, right. So I'm speaking in layman's terms here. I mean, th th this was my philosophy. There's a magazine called Just 17 for Girls. And I read that the target market are 14-year-olds. Because a 14-year-old girl wants to read a magazine that the 17-year-olds are reading. So I thought, well, but by similar logic, if you've never been on stage before and you're looking at books on stand-up, well, one says an in-depth guide. And it says, this is definitely an advanced book. But if you've never been on stage before, 17 of the chapters on writing, and you can skip to those. I don't think many people would go, I'm not clever enough for that, because no one likes to think they're stupid. So they buy the book knowing it's advanced. They want to, like the 14 to 17-year-old thing. And then they read it, and they like it. And they write to me and say, I've never been on stage before, and you helped me with my first show. Now, this was. So rewarding because I planned this, hoping it would happen. When the reviews started coming in, I thought they were going to be one-star reviews occasionally saying, he should have made it clearer. It's not for beginners. I was terrified, but it didn't. So the range of people giving it five-star reviews are from never been on stage before to 36 years. That's the range. So I found that what I worked out was I have to write a book that's advanced, that's absorbable uh, for everyone. And, and, and it seems that that's happened. You can only go by your reviews. You know, you talk about writing a joke on the Wednesday and seeing it on the Friday, only two days. I had to wait eight months. Yeah, and hoping that if this goes well, it's going to be so good for me. And if this doesn't go well, it's going to be... Did, did you feel, feel like a fear that, does this go through? Because it's definitely an advanced approach. I didn't know how it's going to go. And you, you, when anyone's doing something that's, that's being well received, they always do that humble thing of like, no, I had no idea. I spent £1,200 making that book happen, including everything, including illustrations and the app that I, I did it on. The entire thing, including cover design, everything. I mean, I designed the light bulb. My, ne my nephew, who I paid, 16-year-old nephew, 17-year-old uh, nephew, did the graphics for a light, a light bulb as in he made it happen. And I used a cover designer called Alice Briggs in the States who did the layout and she came out with the idea. Do you remember the quotes are coming out like rays of light? Right? She came out with that. So she put a cherry on top. So my ne nephew did the graphics, but I spent minimal money and the book went into profit on day 13. And I, I remember thinking, as long as I get my money back, I feel um, successful. And I got I, it went into profit on day 13. Then uh, sales in the States were quite low, like 7%. So I plowed over a couple of, uh, maybe over eight weeks, I plowed two and a half thousand pounds on adverts in, on Instagram, targeting different cities in the States. So I spent twice as much on advertising as I spent making it happen. And that money came back eventually. It didn't come back immediately. But then in January, I can, I'll show you now, one second. We're only, we're only 11 days into a month, but it gives you an idea, right? So right now, a refresh, this is a live refresh. 34% of sales in the United States uh, so far this month. And the, the record was 36. I think in November, 36%. But right now, you're the first person I've had. Oh, this has just happened. I got 49% sales in the UK. That's the first time right now that it's been more sales outside of the UK than the, inside the UK. You know, but that's January. You know, January isn't finished yet. So 49%, you know, that's only you know one month. But the point is that if in any given month, like, you know, 36% was the most I've had in the States. 
Obviously, those adverts are prob. Well, not obviously. It could be podcasts. You, that's the thing. You don't know what's what. unless someone says to you, "I bought your book because of an advert," which is, which has happened. But someone said to Coca Cola, "What does better, the billboard adverts or the ones on the side of buses?" And they said, "We can't possibly know." You know, even the person drinking it can't know. I think there's like a lot, lots of like a word of mouth going on. Like if you look at the reviews, they're incredible. I I just checked. There were like 124 reviews on Amazon UK, and the average is 4.9, which is something that that doesn't happen. Like that, no, nothing's that that good. Well, do you know? Do you know what's funny is it was 5.0 average until three days ago, where someone gave it one star, Ooh. but they did they didn't review it. They didn't review it, and it's got 96 percent fives. It's got six four star reviews, but until that one person put the one up, it was a five point zero average. Because I thought the second someone gave it a four, it would go down to four point nine. That was my logic, right? Because it's not one hundred percent, but it's not true. If you've got way, 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 way more fives and fours, it still says at five point zero. So if you if we'd had this interview three days ago, you'd be saying it's a five point zero average. So you've touched a little bit of a nerve oh. here because <laughs> yeah, this is a it's, it's horrible. You wake up one morning. And you see, oh, I've got a new review. And you click on it, and it says one star. And the worst thing is, they didn't review it, which is very strange. Because if you hate something that much, you'd think you'd bother to explain why, wouldn't you? Yeah, it sounds like like giving like one star out of spite. Just like, just like nothing, nothing's that good. So like, let's let's take take him down a notch. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing is, you can't. Um, if it's a review, you can see if it's verified or not. You can see if they bought the book or not from Amazon. But with a click, you can't know the history of that click. So, you know, but, you know, someone could some could be bought it as a gift and they didn't understand it. You know, it is an advanced book. And if you if you bought an advanced book for someone who's, whose friend says, you're really funny, you should be a comedian, Happy Christmas is this book, they pick it up and go, this is really complicated, it's boring me. They give it one star. You know, I, I can understand it happening. Look, it, no one's going to love everything that anyone does. N- no one's going to create any, anything that everyone loves. But, but it was quite hurtful when I saw that come up. It's like because you've ruined the five now because one such a dip it, it affected the numbers. Whereas if they'd given it a four, it might have stayed at five point zero because there were so many more fives and fours. But you know, the, reviews are very important. They're, they're very important, and they're, they're they're not just important for sales. They're important for me because. It wasn't until I got the first review that I realized I'd achieved, at least for one person, why it's out to do. You know, you write a joke and you find out the next day if it's funny. And I had to wait eight months. Obviously, I was writing it to even a week before it came out. So some bites of it I found out a week, two weeks later. But the bulk of the book was written in the first two months. The rest of it was fine-tuning. So, yeah, waiting. Let's, let's say waiting five months to find out if what you've done is good. When you get that first review, and I remember where I was standing in the street when I read <laughs> it, and um, yeah, yeah, it was like it, it was because it went every bullet point, every sentence confirmed what I wanted to achieve. And I, the best way I could put it is if you wrote a film and you were in the cinema and the audience were crying when you wanted. I mean, imagine spending two years writing a film, then raising the money and then get it made, then it reaches actual mainstream cinemas, and you sit in a cinema. Can you imagine? If you wrote and directed it and you sit in the cinema and the audience are crying or they're laughing at the right moments in mass, mm. can you imagine how good that must feel? Yeah, like, is this like what what's my dent in the world? And like, that's got to be a weird feeling. Like, I made it, I made it, I made it. Very hard not to sort of end up sound like you're doing a humble mm. boast. I make this very clear. I'm very proud of the book. But when you get those reviews and you... People say what well, it's done for them. I probably get two emails a day and maybe two private messages on Instagram saying, "Just wanted you to know I've read your book and it's done this for me or whatever." Some some people show me a before and after of a routine and show, "Look, I've applied the bloom pop, I've applied the seesaw," um, and it, it's so rewarding. It's it, it, it's so so rewarding. That being, you know, the the the, the buzz I'm getting from the feedback is I had a. M- much bigger impact on me than the money I'm earning from the book. I mean, obviously there could be a stage where the book's so successful that it's life-changing money. It's not life-changing money. It's made a difference. It's made a difference to my income. Um, in fact, it's made a big difference to my income. Until it's life-changing money, I'm getting a bigger buzz from the reviews than the, than the royalties. 
hundred percent. I would show you how how it changed my writing, but like it's all in Finnish and like it doesn't quite quite translate if I just trans translate it. But you you mentioned the concept of uh, seesaw. Is it language independent? Because it seems to work in Finnish, but does it work in other languages or is it just like fundamental? Well, we probably gotta explain what the seesaw is. So yeah, I, I believe that the the playground ride of a seesaw is international. And if someone doesn't know, if someone's reading in a second language, they can Google seesaw and see what it is. But um, but yeah, all countries. Yeah. in Finnish. Right. So everyone's got a seesaw. Um. So the seesaw theory, which was the first chapter I wrote, and it's not chapter one, um, is basically I noticed that if a punchline has got a pause in the middle, there really should be noticeably more syllables on one side than the other. It doesn't matter if it's the left or the right, as long as the right. So that's why I said a seesaw, because it's weighted downwards. So I was talking to someone about this the other day, and he said, a bit like a rim shot. You know what a rim shot is? Yeah. And I paused, and I went, that's exactly what it is. Two, one. Twice as many on one side or the other. Now, if someone did a joke in an old style, you know, Frank Sinatra kind of nightclub-y kind of environment, and the band's behind him, and he goes, turns around, and he fell on the floor. It doesn't work. Yeah. I never thought about it like that way. Like I, I th- th- think a lot about like rhythm. Like I, 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 I write music also not well, but I do. And I've never thought about like it being a punchline shaped pattern. It's really uh, obviously rules are made to be broken, but it's really noticeable. And when a punchline sounds wrong with a pause in it, you, if you go and guess what it was. The rabbit was given for Christmas. It doesn't work. Guess what it was? A rabbit. Guess what? There's a rabbit. It's short, one sh- short, and my mum kind of really drew my attention to this when I was 10 years old because she said that one syllable surnames go better with longer first names and vice versa. So Adam Bloom is a seesaw. I'm sorry to tell you, but your name isn't. Yeah, I, I, I was immediately thinking when I read it, like, Damn, my parents. <laughs> but, that, but, it but it doesn't mean it. But, but it doesn't mean it can't have a nice sound to it. It doesn't mean it can't have. A, you can have. I mean, there are plenty of long names that are beautiful that have got two and two and two. And, and plenty. And your name's a nice name. How do you pronounce the surname? Lehto. Okay, <laughs> Henry Lehto. Yeah, that that I, I like that. There's another thing that's important with names, and that is how the words join. So Adam Bloom's very easy to say because the M sound sets your mouth up for the B. It rolls. It rolls. So the thing is that your name rolls nicely, and um, yeah, the uh, the Y to the L goes quite easily. It's not it's not entirely rolls, but then ni- it creates nice sounds. So there are some seesaw names that are boring, boring, boring names, and there are some non seesaw names that are very, very nice to say. So it's not as simple as a name wrong. But my mum was just saying. If you've got a really long surname, it's best having a short first name. This theory is uh, a very it's it's a very good example of what the book is doing. You uh, like coined a term that I at least I haven't heard used anywhere else in this context. And I asked around, like, "Hey, do you know this this uh, term like seesaw used in comedy context?" Like nobody was like, "No," and you coined this term, and then. You like ex- put into words something that I and many people who are writing have been writing jokes for for a long time are doing instinctively, but you don't yeah. know why you're doing this. Why does this sound better when you do this? You know that, yeah, I kind of need to move this here or there. That was just like the first thing in in the book. You came like. Guns blazing. The, here's the here's the first chapter. Like I was like, oh, there's no like long intro. Like I was born here and there and no, this is the seesaw and and this is how it works. And I, uh, yeah. <laughs> the reason I kept it at the beginning was it was the first thing I wrote, and also I thought, you know, let's hit the ground running. Let's let's punch them right between the eyes with a the theory. The other thing that I, I I fluked was that on Amazon you get a free sample of the first two chapters. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, it might be three. So the point is that people are reading that first. So people will go online and look at that, and it grips them straight away. Now, I didn't realize there would be the bonus of of the of the 
Amazon sample, which is great. But I also wanted to hit them hard because I thought if you're going to struggle with this bit, then the book's not for you. So I put them in hard. I put them in hard. I didn't, I didn't build up to it and get more complex. I was like, we're going in hard here. Then you can start the book and realize it's going to be very technical. And then it gets, some bits get easier. I mean, you know, some chapters are, are far more, I think the chapters on writing are the densest, the most dense. Um, but the thing is, the, the, the CISO, no, I've never heard anyone discuss the, that rhythm and therefore it hasn't got a name because no one's discussed it. But the reason it happened was I was writing for one comedian face to face and I changed one of his punchlines. He says, why is it better like that? And I went into my feelings and I went, um, and it just came out. It was a bit like going to the therapist and then finding out that you didn't like your dad when you did, you thought you did like your dad. You know, I, I had to just go inside my head. And then, then when I started writing the book, I realized that there were dozens of things like that, that I have thought about. And now it's making me think about them. So the, the book was bigger than it was intended to be because I discovered things as I was writing it, which was very exciting. I go to, I go down to write three bullet points about a point. And I realized there's a fourth thing I want to say that I didn't know until I started writing it. So I, I, I learned as I was writing the book. Yeah, and you're saying that it's hard and dense, but then again, in my eyes, it's so clear and there's like a sense of clarity and simplicity. So it didn't feel like hard at, at all. It, 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 were, it was revelational to me rather than hard. Like, just like this the light bulb is is the the mic light bulb is the cover of the book and it was a like lightning moment and and when i was talking with other people on 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 facebook about this book there's a, there's a, like a uh comedians group in in finnish facebook and there were many people who were like okay i just started reading this and like holy shit this is i'm immediately getting something immediately and that's very rare You've made my day. And <laughs> the thing is like, because I don't know the, you know, I know Tommy Willemain, but I don't know anyone in Finland. I've crossed, used the airport on my way to <laughs> Estonia once. Well, I'd love to go. And maybe you can invite me one day and I'll do, do a talk. But the but point is that as long as someone can understand it, as in speak good English as a second language, why should they feel any different to anyone in England or America or Canada? But it's still very touching. Right now I'm, I'm emotional. Because I'm finding out that people in Finland are talking about it. You mentioned it in your first email to me, but not in much detail. You didn't. You didn't say all that. But the point is that this is a, a, amazing for me to hear this. It's absolutely amazing. But you know, my my sales of the nationalities it, it hasn't got Finland on the list because it's probably not in the top um, numbers. They get on Amazon, right? There's there's also the fact that. Uh, for example, when I bought it on Amazon, I, I purchased it on Amazon.com, and I'm not quite sure whether it shows me as Finnish. Oh, uh, like got it, got I it. When I purchased it for Kindle, and, got it. Okay. and my, my friends, uh, friends and colleagues who, who have been purchasing it on, on paper, paper they, they purchased it from Amazon.co.uk. Uh, uh, I believe. Does it so, get posted? Does it get? Do you have to pay postage from England to? Uh, we do, uh, but it, it's. It's not. Uh, I I don't think that's too expensive. Like uh, it's quite common right. to. I don't I don't purchase books on paper. I I exclusively Kindle them. So I'm I'm kind of out of the loop on on that one. Well, that so that means that for all I know, there were people in Estonia having this conversation. For all I know, then that very well might be. So like, shout out to, the, right. to all, all of our Estonian friends if if you yeah, are listening. Hey everybody. But no, I mean. Look, it's still early stages. It only came out on the first of September, so it's um, it's 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 very exciting. I still, you know, it's still a big part of my day every day. It's not like I've got on with my life now and I've got this book just, you know, getting me royalties. It's you know, I'm I'm doing podcasts regularly, and and I'm doing I'm going I'm going to Holland uh, in what's today in two days to do two masterclasses and a Q and A, um, and then one gig, um, which is because someone got in touch with me from Holland and went, there's a buzz about your book. This is all new. This is all new to me. I'm not, you know, it's like if you're with, if I get recognized in the street, I've had that for 30 years now, 28 years now. I go, oh yeah, nice to meet you, blah, blah, selfie, done, right? And I and I forget about it the second they walk away because it's just a, an, another thing I've done a thousand times. 
this is new. You you telling me this is new. It's it's so exciting. And I tell anyone who wants to write a book, you just get Vellum on a Mac and write it and get a KDP account, Kindle Direct Publishing, upload it, and you're away. And then that your book's being printed globally. Isn't that exciting? This is the book equivalent of being a YouTuber. Yeah. And suddenly, like some marginal country in the outskirts of Europe is like, yeah, yeah, all of comedians around here are raving about your 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 book. But like regarding the workshops, uh, we we do have a uh, comedy workshops here, uh, and uh, the person person that's been uh, organizing comedy workshops in in Finland has actually has been a guest of of this podcast like three episodes ago, Ida Grönlund. So so like maybe I could like put you to in together and see whether we could figure something out because thank you there are like numerous people who are very interested in taking workshops um, i've done two in england i've got a third one coming up and i've got two in holland this week uh, where in holland 14 people limited to 14 people sit around a table for six hours with me and they take turns asking questions and their questions can take 15 minutes to be answered this is proper time so if if we're aiming at 14 people i i i'd say that's easily doable like a like, couple of times over like the right. well we we sold out the first one holland so we're doing a second one but the, the, in that obviously you get more than 15 minutes each but i'm saying that people have their main question and then we talk for their but also they hear me answering other people's questions which could answer some questions you didn't really know you had but it's six hours around a table and um and and it's very it's it's been very productive. In fact, one person came twice. One person came to the second one. I did. Oh, that's but that's the, telling. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Um, um, either that because they didn't listen the first time. <laughs> but but the, the the vital thing is that they read the book first because on the second one there were two people who skimmed through the book and there's one who hadn't picked it up. They didn't have any questions to ask. That's a that's a waste of money in my opinion. You're getting a chance to ask the author anything you want. Because you know you, you want to be clear, but a hundred thousand words, there's no way everyone who reads a hundred thousand words is going to understand every single thing you say. There's going to be questions, right? So that that that's really fun and fun as well. And again, it's very you know it's very humbling when you realize people are prepared to travel. You know, one guy traveled for seven seven hours to be there. It, this was partly because of traffic, but like England has traffic, right? You know, it comes in at four hours or five hours and ends up being seven. Yeah, it's, it's it's incredible. And it's not, so it's not just the book, it's the writing jobs, it's the the master classes, and meeting people like you, you know, you wouldn't have known I existed in your whole life and vice versa, right? So the comedy world's pretty small when you think about it. It's incredibly small. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, regarding the book, uh, like, let's not give everything away, but uh, let's at least scratch the surface so people know what to expect from your book. Because, like, I think the concepts themselves speak for themselves. And once you like scratch the surface of them, you realize that okay, this guy knows this and that, and there are revelations that that we are getting. But apart from the CISO, what is your favorite concept in the book? I think a triple punch. Because when I was new, I'd watch a really good comedian and think, God, this is so funny. This is just so good. But I didn't know why. And then it occurred to me that a couple of things can happen at the same time. And uh, when three things happen at the same time, so there's double punches and triple punches, when there's a triple punch, on a split second in the joke, the actual w- word, the keyword, often the final word, not just you getting a joke, you get a visual image that's strong, you get an emotional hit, and you get a cerebral hit where you have to work out what the joke is. So your brain goes, piecing the dots, oh, that, I worked it out. But your brain's been stimulated. Then the result of that stimulation is an immediate mental image when you piece it together and an emotional hit. And when you realize that a joke's got a triple punch or several jokes in a row with double punches, you realize that you're stimulating your audience far more than somebody who just says, I'm walking down the street and this happened, this happened, then he said this, da da da, it's a funny thing. 
it's fine doing that kind of comedy, but when you want to really overload people's senses, you can realize that you can add punches to a joke. You can reverse engineer information to make sure the punchline's got more impact. So I break down a joke, a triple punch joke with somebody else's, and then I rewrite the joke so there's no triple punch. I put one of the punchlines early on, the, the visual image, and later on, there's no emotion. And you go, okay, it's still a good joke. But look how much better it is with the triple punches. So, you know, it's giving people the tools to do something that great comedians are doing without thinking about. I'm, I'm allowing you to be a better comedian if you haven't reached that stage yet. There you go. That's the best I've ever put. I, that's the best I've ever put it. I'm giving you the tools to be a better comedian if you haven't already reached that stage. When I read the book, uh, the thing I was thinking thinking about all the time was like the other books I've read are how do you get to zero to good and this book is how you get to, from good to great and that's right. it's doing a stellar job in in that thank you so much and it's just not me talking it's it's basically all the discussions i've had around this around this book with the comedians who who've read it it's been making waves during the last couple of weeks is there such a thing that uh, a joke that's too smart or is it always in the formulation and delivery? I've seen very clever jokes that don't work because they're slightly ambiguous. And I talk about mazes, you know, a saleable joke is a maze in the, your audience's mind. And if there's two exits to the maze and they come out the wrong exit, they haven't failed, you have. There's this horrible arrogance that some comedians have when they've got a joke that could be taken two ways. If I come out the wrong exit and think that's not very funny, oh, he meant that or she meant that. I'm not laughing by the time I've worked out what they actually meant because I've already got out the wrong exit. The moment's gone. The moment's gone. So there are, yes, I've seen very clever jokes that get that kind of, there's a pause, we work it out, and there's no explosive laugh. But again, I talk about rolling energy in b- balls and cubes, that creating the right energy before a clever joke. Some jokes are so clever. Some jokes are more clever than funny. And therefore, you want to put energy in the room before that punchline, but so that the momentum's in the air. So when they get it, the tension in the uh, in the room allows that to turn to a laugh. So sometimes, when a very clever joke doesn't get a laugh, even if it's perfectly written, it could be it's being d- delivered at the wrong time in your set. So finding the right time to do it, making sure it's not ambiguous. I mean, Stephen Wright is the cleverest joke writer in the world, in my opinion, and he's got jokes that are really cerebral, but they're clear. I'll give you an example. I've got to paraphrase it slightly. He said, I was walking past a a 24-hour grocery the other day. There's a guy locking up. I I said, hey, it says it's open 24 hours. He said, it is, but not in a row. Mm. Beautiful, right? I mean, we've all seen someone lock in a shop that says 24 hours. I, I certainly have. But the idea that he's gone, well, maybe it's open 24 hours in total in the whole lifespan of its business. Who'd, who'd open a shop, paint it, get a copyright, the name, sign writers in, staff, all the stock. But once it's been open for 24 hours in total, you close the business down forever. That's such a beautiful idea. But when you hear the wording, it says it's open 24 hours. It is, but not in a row. Not in a row is such a succinct way of saying, once this shop's had 24 hours of business, it will close down forever. Look how succinct it is. And more importantly, look how clear it is. Yeah, and connects things that weren't connected before. And that's basically yeah. every good punchline is connecting and yeah. how well it connects. That's where the gold is. I suppose the question you could be asking is, is there such thing as a joke that's too clever for anyone? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the thing is that, you know, a, a p- person writing the jokes has got to be clever. It's very likely that there's a cl- one cleverer person than you in the audience. You know, comedians are not the cleverest person in every room they ever walk in. They think they are. Let's be honest. Of course. But <laughs> yeah, but, you know, um, I just I just don't like it when people say, oh, they didn't get that joke. I think, how do you know they didn't get it and not laugh? They might not have warmed to you. They might have got it silently and just gone, yeah, it's quite funny. You know, a joke not getting a laugh doesn't mean no one got it. It's a very delusional thing to assume you know what everyone's thinking in a room. Yeah, or or if you're doing a, a joke with a reference that's quite obscure and nobody laughs, it might be that it's a shit joke, not, not the reference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I talk, I talk about cultural references as well, and um, and the pros and cons of references that not everyone's going to get. I break down probably the most convoluted part of the book is is me breaking down when to and when not to take risks on cultural references. 
and how to make them work for you and how to make them not alienate the people who don't get them and maximize the impact on the people that do get them and where not to ever do them. So I go very deep. I, I go very, very deep. Yeah, it, it's got a lot of death. And I was watching this one Patton Oswalt special and I realized that that's something I could never do because I don't, I don't have an audience. He said that, yeah, my set is like a Pixies song. And he assumed that his audience knows how the dynamics in a obscure early 90s alternative rock band go. And it worked for him, but for any other audience, like that reference is not going to go through. Right, right. And he could have said Nirvana, but he didn't. Listen to this. I met Pat Oswald in 1998 mm. at Just for Laughs in Montreal. And I met him with Doug Stanhope. I was interviewing them both for the Comedy Channel, the Paramount Comedy Channel over here, and the footage didn't get used. I interviewed them. I went to a barber shop and had my hair cut and tried out material on a barber. And the footage, and I wouldn't it be lovely to be able to find, because I was 27. So Stanhope would have been maybe 27, I don't know how old he is, but not probably the same age as me, maybe one or two years older. Patton was a couple of years older. He would have been maybe early 30s, and I don't know. But, but there would have been a, a young Stanhope and a young Patton Oswald. That would be gold. <laughs> yeah. Were they big at the time already? Or no, like no, no, up and no, coming? They no, they weren't. No, no, they weren't. And Stanhope was a young, good-looking man. Oh. <laughs> I'm kind of ashamed that I was surprised. Like, oh. <laughs> no, he, he'd be the first to admit he hasn't looked after his body. You know, he drinks a lot and whatever. But, you know, he's a, a phenomenal talent. He's been to Finland I guess two times. I've I've seen him twice, and he's been incredible both times. Oh, he's a, a, absolute genius! For me, he's surpassed Bill Hicks. <gasps> oh, that's that's a big thing. Bill Hicks is the thing that got me into comedy in the first place. So, like, my origin story was hearing Bill Hicks for the first time, and then realizing that okay, this stand-up comedy is more than just a couple of jokes at the end of some like late night show, and that's the road I'm still on. Like, 15 years down and counting. All of the people that we mentioned right before, they all got a very strong comedic persona. This is kind of a, like a big open-ended question, but how does one find their comedic persona? I think audiences, I mentioned this in the book, audiences pull you towards what's funny about you, like a magnet. And I don't mean pleasing crowds, because pleasing crowds with what material you think they like is a very, very slippery slope. It's the quickest route to mediocrity if you try and give people what they want. Uh, you, you give them what they didn't know they wanted. But, the, but with regard to persona, you find your inner clown by going in front of audiences and occasionally doing something that's a quirk of yours and they like it. And then what they're doing is they're helping you take off all the layers on top of you and find the inner clown that is your sense of humor. And it, it's very rarely instant. I know a few people it was instant for, but for me, I was aggressive at the beginning. I was all black. I was a bit shouty. You know, we find, we emulate our heroes for the first six months. Gradually finding your persona, I mean, I don't know. Like, I've written about helping people to find their persona. This is a complicated thing, right? This isn't a seesaw. You know, this is not a seesaw. You know, you cannot put, a persona down to chords or, or formulas. I, I talk in depth about persona and I, people are saying it helped them, but it's very hard for me to really summarize it in a short conversation because it's a very complicated thing, but the persona is what the jokes hang on. You know, j jokes do not define your persona. They enhance it and they reaffirm it. Someone comes on moving like they're grumpy, looking like they're grumpy, and then they say something that confirms that they're grumpy. The persona is not in the material. The persona is in the way you carry yourself, the way you look, the way your energy is, the way your body language is, and sometimes the way you dress. The way you dress can contradict it, and then we find out actually he's not like that. But the fact of the matter is what you, that your material is not your persona. Your material is hanging on something that already exists. If you've got a, like a really good bit, but it's slightly off persona, should you keep it or kill it? You can tweak it. You can change your status in it. If you're always winning and you never lose, you've got a story where you lose, swap the characters over so you're the one who wins. Or change it slightly so you win or lose, depending on what you want to do. 
if you're constantly doing stuff that's out of character, then the audience won't know who you are. You're cocky one minute, you're humble the next minute, you're mischievous the next minute, you're cynical the next minute. What's going on? However, again, this is another bit going deep. You can have one bit that doesn't feel like it's you, but you could just momentarily say, I'm not always this grumpy. The other day I did this. You could just put one tangent, but if you keep doing that, then you're, you're giving across the wrong message who you are. You know, sitcom characters, you watch Seinfeld, you know what George would say, you know what Kramer would say, you know what Elaine would say. Maybe not so much Elaine, I don't think she's as, as strong a personality, but you certainly know what George would say in any situation. And Seinfeld would make fun of George for his, you know, neuroses or self-obsessed nature. And so George says something that's a little bit neurotic or, you know, self-absorbed, and then Jerry will call him on it and point out what he's, what he's being an idiot. Um, you swap those scripts over, it doesn't work. George can't tell, tell Jerry that he's getting things wrong in life because he's the one getting things wrong in life. Jerry's the wise guy, right? It's uh, something that a lot of people, including myself, uh, are struggling. Like, what is the aspect of your persona that you want to amplify on stage and what do you want to tone down? Because like, there's material that works for different aspects and the consistency should be the key, but that's the hard part. Like, where do you head? What's the real you? Yeah, you know, there's also the real you. Or there could be an alter ego, a creation. You know, you you can decide I'm going to create something that's not me, right? Um, and that doesn't have to be a character. That doesn't mean dressing up as a bus driver. That can also be an alter ego. You know, that it's it's an extension of you. Um, Harry Hill was the reason I became a comedian. And Harry Hill's it's not a character, but it's not him. But it's an alter ego where he allows his own sense of humor to hang on. So he's created this slightly clowny guy. Do you know who he is? Uh, I don't believe he's known uh, in Finland. I urge your listeners to look up Harry Hill. And uh, again, there you go. There's no seesaw, but it's a nice sound because it's Harry Hill, right? Yeah. So, you know, names don't have to be seesaws, but punchlines do pretty much. Unless there's a twist of expectation that allows to, to something bigger than the seesaw to happen. But anyway, the Harry Hill, I watched him and I was doing stand-up two weeks later. But his stand-up, you have to look at stand-up because he, he had a family show as well that was very inventive called um, TV Burp. But the point is that Harry Hill's stand-up is as inventive as I've ever seen stand-up comedy performed ever. That's going on my next to check out list. But he wears a comical outfit. And he wears a, a black suit, normal suit, but he wears collars, open shirt collars. The collars are four inches bigger than they should be. So he's got these big collars. And it, it's... Sounds Stan Hope, Ian. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking... No, no, no. This is, this is clowny. Oh, okay. Clowny. <laughs> yeah. But the point is that what he created was an alter ego. It wasn't a character, but he's a quirky man that's created... He's, he's allowed his uniqueness to shine with this creation, which is a quirky, clowny man. But it's not character comedy, but it's alter ego. And there's a difference, right? But my point is, there's three ways you can do it. You can be yourself and exaggerate your own quirks. You can create an alter ego, or you can put on a mask and be someone completely different. And I don't have any less respect for any of them. You know, Some comedians go, oh yeah, they're, they're hiding behind a mask. I'm being myself. Well, you know what? It's a skill to hide too. Yeah, it's definitely something that you need to be good at or otherwise it comes out as phony and the people who are really good at it i respect them so much like anthony cheselnik has this incredible alter ego nobody believes that oh that's the real you yeah sure my my favorite comedian is uh, pretty much neil hamburger uh, uh, sean Locke's my favorite comedian but working today uh, neil hamburger is a, a character com comedian pure comedian's comedian and i he's my favorite I'm watching him, like, how does he do that type of approach rather than, like, he's the funniest thing. Like, he's incredibly skilled, and I'm watching him out of interest. How do you do that? That's super. One concept that you mentioned in your book was virtual comedy, and that's something I'm seeing. To me, it's the equivalent of YouTube reaction videos. What is virtual comedy? This is my uh, description. There are three types of virtual comedy, in my opinion. One is making fun of something that's already a joke, which means the comedian is failing to get the joke because they're making the same joke back. They're making fun of something or someone or something someone said, 
and failed to realize that that person was joking. It's very embarrassing. They're making a joke on the back of them failing to get a joke. And it happens all the time. And that is embarrassing because you're supposed to be the person in the room that's bringing us humor. And all you're doing is reporting that you inadvertently reporting that you failed to get humor. And audiences sometimes laugh at it because they haven't had time to think about what the other person said. It can be painful to watch. Making fun of something that was a joke and pointing out the joke that was intended as your creation, mocking the person. It's, it's painful. Now, another type of virtual comedy is finding flaws in something that you don't understand. And the example I made up, because obviously I couldn't do really real examples, I'd offend comedians by saying that the jokes are rubbish. So I said, oh, I saw a sign outside a shop. It said, no dogs apart from guide dogs. I thought, well, they're hardly going to read that, are they? So, you know, the point is the, the, the sign is to let people with guide dogs, people able, sighted people with friends with guide dogs, that their dogs are allowed in. It's also letting people know when they see a dog go in the shop with a blind person, that's different for them. It's not for you. So it makes perfect sense to have a sign saying no dogs apart from guide dogs. You know, that kind of joke, it's like audiences will laugh because it's said with confidence and they've had a few drinks and they haven't got time to think it through. And you might go, well, what's wrong with that? As long as they're laughing, because they won't wake up thinking about how good it was. They won't be walking down the street one day and seeing a sign and laugh themselves. They'll, like, they'll see the sign and they'll probably go, Actually, there's every reason for that sign to be there. The, the stuff that's really, truly brilliant stays with you. And 10 years later, you'll think of it and you'll smile to yourself. And, you know, comedy is giving people a gift that they can keep forever. They'll probably forget you. But if you watch enough comedy, you're going to remember some of it. And don't you want to be the, p the comedian that people remember rather than the one they forget? Saying virtual comedy is acceptable is like saying there's no point putting nutrition in food because it all fills your stomach. It can fill your stomach, but will it do any good afterwards? And the, uh, um, the third type of virtual comedy, which is more forgivable, is when somebody is reminding you of something you've laughed at. So the example I give in the book is the Jerry Springer show. When Jerry Springer first came out, every comedian was like, oh, you've seen Jerry Springer? And the audience start laughing. They're laughing because they remembered laughing at Jerry Springer. You're not giving them anything. You're just putting a mirror next to a painting and say, look at this new painting. Now, the reason this is the the forgivable of the three, is because it can be done with great performance. You can do an impression of Jerry Springer. You can do an impression of the accents of the guests and their body language, and then you're acting it out. And then the, the talent is being displayed in the performance. Or you might springboard that into a whole new creative bit about Jerry Springer, where you're being inventive. So a combination of new ideas on top of that, or, and sorry, um, good performance, I've got no problem with someone saying Jerry Springer gets some crazy people on that show, then doing a really good impression of them, then doing a parody and then exaggerating it and twisting and turning it and then something very brilliant comes, that's fine. But the first two types of virtual comedy, nah, no space for it. And um, if, you, if someone gets away with it and they, laugh, they see the audience laughing, they're not really thinking it through because when you watch someone like Harry Hill who's put the bar as high as it can go but for originality and someone on the same bill does that, if they're following Harry Hill, the audience will sense something's not right. If they're one before Harry Hill, they'll go, I enjoyed that guy, but that last guy was unbelievable. And if they're on a bill of people doing okay comedy, they'll get away with it. But you can't repeatedly remind people of stuff they've laughed at, make fun of things that are already jokes, and find flaws in something without understanding them for a career. If you, if you, do, if you do more than one or two of them in your set, the audience will start to sense they're watching something that's not actually as original. They'll, they'll, they'll spot it. Cream rises to the top and, and, um, in, that, in our industry, and you can only fool some of the people some of the time with that stuff. If you get away with it and you're listening to this now and you're thinking, well, I, I do lots of that. I mean, I'm not out to offend anybody, right? I'm out to point out that if you're doing that, you could maybe do something better maybe. But who am I to say what's good? I'm just giving you an analysis. Like, a, let's put them A, B, and C. Making fun of something that's already a joke and you not realizing it was a joke in the first place, that's, there's no argument for that. It's not comedy because you've missed the comedy and reported the comedy as your own bit whilst making fun of the comedy. That, that's not even debatable. 
And you go, yeah, but the audience were laughing. Okay. They laughed because they probably hadn't had time to work out that you, the thing you reported, the newspaper headline. That's like playing a really bad cover song and like people remember the original and like, yeah, Stay Was to Heaven's pretty good, but you know, your rendition of it, it didn't bring it anything new there. It's just, it's not sustainable. Yes, but at least they learned to play the guitar and sing. <laughs> well, yeah. No, no, I'm saying that that's a good example, but displaying some talent. But if a lot of the time when people, this is the thing, right? When people make fun of something, not realizing it's a joke, they don't know they're doing virtual comedy because they didn't get the joke. So what they're doing is like when someone's, you know, their bum's showing, they've got their jeans hanging down, you can see their bum. You go, oh my God, pull your trousers up. He doesn't know his bum showing. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't know his bum showing. It, I could have done that before. I could have knelt down in the gym, forgot to pull the string on my shorts and my bum showed. No one walks down the street going, I think my bum's showing, and then doesn't do anything about it, right? So when you do virtual comedy, it's because of, of, of the A type, it's because you don't realize you didn't get the joke. So maybe the thing I'm encouraging people to do is to think about when they make fun of something and ask themselves for a second, What was the person actually trying to say? Because when you make fun of a, a news headline, but the news headline is ironic, or song lyrics. I've seen people quote song lyrics and make fun of the singer. And I'll go, no, no, no. That was a witty line. There was hyperbole in that line. And you've taken it literally and gone, well, as if no one would do that. No, they wouldn't do that. It's called art. But, 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 but you may as well look at a Picasso and go, no woman would have an eye coming out of her nose. No one looks like that. No, it's art. And a, a song lyrics with with um, humor in them, no matter how subtle, could just be exaggeration. Uh, is often being creative. So to try and be creative, making fun of that, not realizing it's being creative in the first place, is an embarrassing thing to watch. And I, I just suppose just have a look at the things you're mocking and ask yourself, do I have the right to mock that? And so yeah, I think that I, I didn't really make this point in the book. I've exa- this is a This is an extension on my on my chapter now. It's it's not your fault if you're doing A because you don't know you're doing it, and that's the problem. It's like having bad breath. <laughs> like one of one of those is is failing, but not knowing one of one of those is like setting the bar too low. If you're just doing cheap laughs, it's gonna go through to some of the audiences, but in the long run. It gets really awkward for everybody who's in the know, who who understands the language of the comedy and has seen a lot of comedians and realizing what's happening. It's so cringy when people are doing, I would say, easy bits, because that's basically like easy in that sense that, look at this, this is funny, and not giving your best writing effort to it. It's kind of offensive when, when you... <laughs> when, you, when you put your heart into comedy writing and then somebody's like, look at this, look at this, this is this is funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it, some people, it doesn't bother them. You know, if I watch someone doing A, I cringe for them because I think there might be people in the audience here who are thinking, no, that's the joke, mate. That is the joke. But if people laugh and they go, I'm happy, you know, okay, they had a nice time. Who am I to, who am I to suggest they shouldn't be doing that if they have people having a nice time? But You really, it's, it's about the quality bar, yeah. It's about upping your bar. It's about upping your bar. Exactly, exactly. And I I think that's that's the enduring theme of of like both this interview and, and your book, like getting from good to great. So it's not good enough to be just okay because you're supposed to blow your audiences away night after night. And if you're okay when everything else is not optimal, you're not going to do well. Yeah, uh, and if you're undeniable, you fair anywhere that comedy is possible, you will do well. Yes, well put. The um, you talk about the difference between good and great. The chapter on originality, I believe this that chapter started by saying this book could have been called the difference between good and great, but ironically that wouldn't be a very good title. And because it is all the way through, and you know the chapter on ambiguity. Uh, is I talk about that. That can create the difference between bad and great. If someone misinterprets your joke for a bad one, when the other end of the maze was a good joke, blocking off the wrong exit with the wording to clarify it 
makes the difference between bad and great. You don't want 50% of the audience getting a weak joke and 50% of them getting a strong joke, do you? You want them all on board. So blocking off that exit to the maze with the wording so there's only one way out can result in a great joke instead of a bad joke. Well, that's, that's a very powerful tool. When I was reading about the mazes, I was thinking that this is kind of like one of my pet peeves, that some people are thinking that they are doing smart jokes when they, in reality, they are just doing unnecessarily complex and lousily worded jokes that you, you need to work in order to realize what is being said. But that's not smart. That's just confusing. Well, close-up magic is my hobby. And um, a friend of mine said to me, confusion is not magic. But if you go, oh, God, what happened there? That was, that was, that was brilliant. Um, it's only truly brilliant if they realize what's supposed to have happened. So the coin goes in their hand, they close their hand, the coin's gone, wow, that coin vanished. But sometimes overly complicated tricks, which I've been guilty of creating, create confusion. So I've failed as a creator of magic tricks because I've created confusion. And in that confusion, people go, wow, wow, but wow, I don't know what happened there. I'm, I've seen magic, but I don't know what happened is the equivalent of a messy joke. Yeah. They're laughing at some of it. They don't quite understand. They, you, you know, you don't want to lose the audience halfway through a sentence. If you lose the whole audience halfway through a sentence, you can't just keep gigging every night until you find the audience who all get it. It's not, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. You don't have two hundred intelligent people in one room, and the night before, by some incredible coincidence, two hundred stupid people. The room as one went with that joke. You know, I've got a line that gets a twenty percent of the room laughing when I do it, and I'm not dropping it. I've got my one line. That's my one line, and it's gentle, it's poetic, and people choose to laugh at it, and some people choose to not laugh at it, but it's poetic, but I'm not dropping it. I think everyone should be allowed one line that never works, but they love it. I think you're allowed one. But if it's your entire set, no, no, no. Yeah, it's kind of like the equivalent of uh, being really unclear in your enunciation, and like the only two people who are able to make words are laughing. It's not smart, it's just confusing. Yeah, there's one thing I talked about in the chapter on originality when I said about some people, you know, I talked about compromising and pandering being the quickest route, route to mediocrity. Do you know the Mighty Boosh? Have you heard of the Mighty Boosh? Uh, sounds familiar, but I, I believe this is something very British because I... Yes, it's, it's two comedians called Noel Fielding and Julian Barrett, but I supported Julian Barrett on a university tour before he was well-known, long before he was well-known. And um, he was dying on stage maybe one in three shows. But what he did was he refused to compromise his persona and his weird style, and he stuck to it. He developed a force, a force of conviction. So sometimes a thing isn't working. It isn't just the clarity of the material. It's the, you're doing something weird, and you're not getting them on board. And the way to get them on board is to keep doing it and believing in it. So that's not the same as doing jokes that don't work, and you think, well, every now and again, the audience will get the joke. I'm talking about a persona not working. I'm talking about a style. So you might go, there's no difference. I'm not being very clear, and I'll, be, I, 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 I'll try and say this better. When you have a, a personable style, the audience like you, and you've got a few jokes that never work, it's very likely that you're doing something wrong. If they work occasionally, you can't blame the two out of three audiences every t- a week that don't get it. You've got to do something to tweak it. Whereas if you have a complete style that's genuinely different and stands out and is weird. Weird would be the key word. If you're doing something weird and it's not working, sometimes the best thing to do is stick at it because you develop this bulletproof belief in your persona and then the audience start to go with it. And that's the thing of beauty. Someone sticking to their guns when they're doing something weird that's failing. The, the beauty is, I believe in this. I'm going to keep doing it. That's not the same as that one joke isn't working and the audience don't get it. Because if they're liking you, here we are. If they're liking you up until that joke, then there's something wrong at that joke. If you're doing something that they're not liking at all, and you're being weird, the, the problem could be that you don't have enough self belief, and the audience will eventually get on board when you do, you strengthen that muscle. When I talked about compromising, if you're if you have originality in your comedy, every time you go do that original thing, you're working a muscle. And if you compromise by going, oh, this audience look a bit rowdy, I won't do it, I'll do it differently, I'll change my stuff for them. Well, that muscle's going to get weaker because you're not going to the gym as much. So 
having convicted in something weird, and I love the idea that someone's listening to doing something that they know is original and they believe is funny and it's not always working. Sometimes the, the most original comedian on the bill will have the worst gig. Yeah, and imagine like of the people we've mentioned, like Stephen Wright or like Neil Hamburger, if they would water down their personalities, like, oh, you're too weird. Nobody's going to like that kind of comedy. They do what they do, and they're insanely good at what they do. So yes, that's why it works. Like a light version of either would probably not be a good one. Yes, it's, when, it's wonderful when someone is a, a, a genuine one-off and you watch them, you know, they, they might get a little bit frustrated because they're not having as good gigs as other people. People's careers are taken off. They're, you know, they're still renting and their other friends are buying places. Like they could get a little bit bitter or they could not see it as a race and they could just stick to that. They're racing against themselves, themselves getting better. And conviction, I've seen people with extreme conviction doing something weird. And they tell the audience when they walk on stage with their body language, with everything about them, you will like this weird shit. And that's a beautiful thing to watch. Beautiful thing to watch. Yeah, one one thing that we were discussing recently was the uh, amount of confidence, because uh, Finland's very weird in terms of confidence, because here confidence is very often confused with arrogance, and we're very humble people, and we kind of like have this uh, thing that uh, don't stick out, and try to be one of the one of the guys just like don't try to be a star but once you go to stage and tell your jokes in like yeah i kind of believe in this joke and kind of believe in this persona it's not gonna go go well it's better to crash and burn with your persona rather than like well england's got that chapter on persona i um on status rather with kind of permission of chortle i uh printed an article that i wrote in my book Uh, about status and Americans like winners and Brits like losers. So your Finland's I would imagine is lower status than England, but we still like we still like to hear someone put themselves down. Americans will walk on stage and go, "I'm brilliant," and with the audience go, "Yeah, you are." I'm going to tell you why I'm brilliant. Please tell us why you're brilliant. You know, English comedians. You know, that generally speaking, Jimmy Carr's very high status. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, Jack D is very high status, but he's grumpy. He, we, we identify with when we've had a bad day, he's thinking how we think, but you know, America got, you know, Bill Burr is so high status. He tells you at the beginning of a routine that he's going to prove how clever he is and then does it. And they celebrate that, you know, they like the wise guy in England, you know, our most successful comic actor is Mr. Bean. I think maybe, <laughs> uh, Ricky, Ricky Gervais might have overtaken him now, but you know, 10 years ago, Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean was our wealthiest uh, comedian. He, he was worth double second and third place, but uh, he was worth second and third place put together on net worth. And the, the uh, America's biggest comedian is Jerry Seinfeld, who's worth 10 times what Mr. Bean's worth. But, but the point is that their number one's a wise guy who tells everyone how it is. And our number one's a clown who gets everything wrong. Our sitcoms, Only Fools and Horses, a failed con man. The office, a failed office manager. Yes, the Americans did the office. There are exceptions that prove the rule. But it, it, generally speaking, friends, a lot of good-looking people living their nice lives. Um, we've got absolutely fabulous, a failed mother. We like to see losers trying to better themselves. We have an appetite for a loser, but even even bigger appetite we have is for the outsider. We're always the outsiders of Europe because we're on the weird edge of Europe talking a weird language that nobody else understands or speaks and us being weird is a source of pride and and our most successful comedian uh, Ismo Leikola is uh, very much on the weird spectrum his biggest bit that's his hit is about how the word ass works and that's that's basically what his claim to fame he- yeah I've, I've seen him When you just said about the word ask, because I know he does break down language, doesn't he, a lot. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen I've seen many people send me clips of him. He's gone very viral, hasn't he? Yeah, especially the ass bit. He, he's told that he's recognized in Hollywood. He's living in America currently. He's recognized on, on the street in Hollywood, and people are like, you're the ass guy! <laughs> His Conan bit, bit on the word ass has 
something That's like great. 80 million. It's the biggest Conan clip of all time. Oh, really? Yeah, it's incredible. It came out of left field. Uh, that was his like, first big break and immediately knocked it out of the park. That's great. That's great. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, but you've done a very, very good analysis of it. They love an outsider because they are the outsider. Yeah. It's almost a, 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 a mini version of what they are. Yeah, and we have this inferiority complex with Sweden because basically everything that Sweden does, we are doing, but slightly worse. And uh, <laughs> we, are, we have always <laughs> been the, like, the little brother, and it's very ingrained in our national psyche that this is who we are. And the second uh, verse of our national anthem starts with the word, our country is poor and will stay such. You are joking. I am not joking. You can go on Google and translate the Finnish national anthem. What's the motive for saying that? We have this concept of sisu, which is like enduring in the face of hardship. And we pride ourselves in being through so much hardship and still coming out okay. Not awesome, because awesome would be preposterous to say that we are awesome. But we are okay. We take pride in that we have it hard and we have had it hard and we will have it hard, but we are so proud of ourselves. That's pretty much the Finnish motto. Wow. We've got a country called Great Britain for a start. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and yeah, we, we never rules the way that way. And I mean, there's a dodgy line of that Britain never, never, never shall be slaves. It's like, well, yeah, but you've owned slaves, so maybe you shouldn't be bringing that one up. Yeah, Finland is basically <laughs> the second verse is our country is poor and will stay such you should leave if you're searching for gold. That's, that's incredible for national is, anthem. Is that, the, is that the next line? Is that the next line? Yeah. Wow. But your, your economy is going okay, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's doing fine. After the 70s, Finland's been doing incredibly well and we were poor-ish but then we became one of the rich, uh, well, Rich is wrong word. We're doing well. Society is rich and there's very little poverty, but uh, there's also very little actually rich people. So the elite's very small and not that rich. Do you have a royal family? No. Right. Oh, it's Norway has a royal family, isn't it? Norway and Sweden. Yeah. And right, right, we, right. we never was a royal country. We got independent in 1917 and immediately went like, yeah, let's go for president and prime minister. That's, that's our, our jam. But what about when wealthy people sing the national anthem in Finland? Don't they feel a bit stupid in their million-pound mansions going, oh, we're, we're poor and we're going to stay that way? Pass, can you get the butler to pass me some more caviar? Well, unsurprisingly enough, usually we're just singing the first and the last verse of the national anthem and conveniently skip the second one. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. That saves a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, Tommy Willemain, when I first saw him in 2000 and maybe 2003, maybe 2004, he blew me away and he won the, the gong show, the competition at the comedy store. He, he easily won it as well. We, we knew he'd won it. And um, I, I was quite sad when he left the country because I really enjoyed his comedy. You know, I, I wanted him to stay. I wanted to be, him to be part of our culture. But he heard it. He heard his, he sang the national anthem, forgot where he was and left. <laughs> this is my favorite line from the person you just mentioned. <laughs> A homeless guy came up to me in the street and asked me for some change. I gave him one pence. It was the least I could do. It's an awesome line, and he's been doing that line also in, also in Finland. I, did, I didn't know they had uh, English currency. <laughs> um, so, um, but it, it, the, it, it, the, um, it even translates into, into Finnish because it, <laughs> it's, it, the wording works su- surprisingly. Oh, the least I could yeah. do. You use the same yeah. phrase. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very good. And the other line of, it, the other line of his dialect was... Um, I'm from Finland, where the life expectancy is boring. <laughs> oh, that's truth in comedy. That's, that's us, like, everything's safe and boring. <laughs> well, again, he's putting, it, he's putting his country down to us as well. To, he's come to England, a more, you know, a more talked about country, maybe, in the arts, and, and put his country down. Um, but we, we know, made him love it, but we like a loser too, you yeah. see. So actually, a Finnish comedian in England is a very good combination. I mean... Tommy Cooper, who's one of the greatest British comedians ever, he also did magic tricks that went wrong. So he was a failed magician <laughs> who did one line of jokes. And 
they, someone in the States, uh, booking a TV show, saw a clip of him and said, we thought it's really funny, but we would l- prefer if his tricks went right. <laughs> That's America. Like, they, they wanted a winner. Yeah, they wanted a winner. But um, yeah, they didn't, you know, it's, it's very, very interesting. Lee Evans, we've got, you know, I mean, I saw Lee Evans in Montreal and he blew the roof off. It was the biggest storm I've ever seen. So it's not like comedy doesn't translate. It doesn't, um, it's not like, you know, people always say to me, oh, Americans, they don't get our humor and we don't get theirs. Well, yes, actually, <laughs> th- we do. That's why we, half our sitcoms are from America and loads of American comedians have come over here and done very well. So it's not as simple as not getting it. What you do when you watch a comedian is you tune into their wavelength, right? You know, um, Bill Burr's a winner and he comes over here and plays massive rooms. Why? Because English people w- like a- watching a good comedian. But culturally, there are, pa- there are patterns. Culturally, there are patterns. So we could watch a Finnish comedian put themselves down and we could laugh. We could watch a wise guy. You know, Dave Chappelle is a wise guy. Dave Chappelle is telling you how life is. That's incredibly high status. He's telling you how everyone should be thinking or what's wrong with the world around him. And he's not losing. Even the story where he talks about getting booed off, he gets the last laugh because the press said he was booed off. He said, that's not true. I was, I was booed. I did not leave. <laughs> right. So it, it, even a story where he smoked weed with some rappers before his gig and couldn't speak properly and the audience turned on him, started swearing at him and, and heckling him. He still wins. I did not leave. They're wrong. I didn't get booed off. I did not. Leave. He's having an awful, awful situation on stage and he's still the winner. Because he points out that the press were wrong in saying he was booed off. In Finland, we're a bit antsy about Chappelle because, like, his like I'm telling it, it's like this. It doesn't quite. He's incredibly talented. That's that's a given. But for Finnish audiences, it's a bit aggressive. That's uh, quite antithetical of what we are and I, what you're describing English people to or, or British people to be. Were I think were that and double it. What, got it. Okay, so the the gap between your cultural acceptance and behavior is too big a gap between Chappelle and Finland. But it's in England, it's not too big a gap, right? Yeah, we're totally getting Burr, and he's he's been coming to Finland like and selling out out uh, big halls like time after time. But like. I'm I'm not quite sure whether Chappell would 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 translate as well into into the Finnish audience. But we've been putting Finland down for a while. There's one thing I'd like to praise uh, Finland for is that uh, for comedic purposes our language is incredible because our order of words in our sentences is almost completely free. So we can move almost any word anywhere which makes it quite a lot easier to put the actionable word last. Wow. wow. Can you move anywhere, any word? Almost any word, anywhere. It's like if... No, but can you, can you move anywhere, any word? <laughs> any word, any word, anywhere. So you, you, you can have a, a, like a, a Quentin Tarantino film equivalent of in a sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where Bruce Bruce Willis is alive one minute, but he's dead earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Our our language is is the Quentin Tarantino of languages. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. So it makes it easier. Well, that that means you you don't need to read the first three chapters of my book then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you can memento the, but but you yeah. you do need to read read the first chapters because have the ability to move words within within the sentence and uh, to understand the seesaw. Yeah, no, no. So actually, what I should have said was chapter two and three. Yeah. Because chapter two is about the bloom pop, the moment a joke's funny, getting a, the keyword in the right place. And the next one is word smuggling, which is putting information into the setup, which can be very complicated. So you have a nice, free, short punchline. I smuggle words from this punchline into the setup. So it's economical on the punchline because you don't want a, a long, wordy punchline. It's like being hit in the head with a Rubik's Cube and you're being asked to solve it. And also, it can be uh, have a bad rhythm. So sounds like your language is a lot easier for comedy. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I there's, get it. There's one hard part, though. Our words are uh, extremely long, like German long. Oh, really? Yeah. If you see a Finnish word, it, you think that it's a sentence, but it's, it's a word. Our words are insanely long, and there's suffixes that every word have 
we don't have prepositions, we do all of that stuff with suffixes, and that gets our words incredibly long. So word smuggling is a very efficient concept for Finnish language. So, Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But could I just say, word smuggling, um, just going back to the book, word smuggling is something that all good comedians do, but I gave it a title. Yeah, again, and, like um, a concept that yeah. seems intuitive, and nobody's been able to put it to words, and now you did it. A lot of these words I, I came up with when I was writing for people, I would tell them I call this word smuggling. So I had the, I had the word in my head, but I never shared it. So I gave them titles for myself. I don't know why. There's no need to. Give it. If you're doing it inside your head, you don't need a title for it, do you? But, I mean, the, the wider your vocabulary, the easier it is to communicate, right? So if you, if you could just say that joke needs a word smuggle, that's, that's a lot simpler than saying, I think the punch sign's a little bit gabbled and uh, complicated and wordy, and then maybe you could maybe make them set up a bit more information, free up the, you know, you just say, do a word smuggle. And, you know, vocabulary is is a very important thing, right? So I, I didn't invent the word smuggle. I think I discovered the seesaw as a actual noticeable, definable pattern. You instinctively do seesaws, but I consciously noticed it, right? So I consciously noticed something we do, but everyone said, God, I never thought of it like that. I do it, but I never thought of it like that. So I didn't invent the seesaw. I drew people's attention to the fact that they're doing it, having not known about it. So they're very different things because the word smuggle, people know they do it. They know they, they know it's my word, but I gave it a, I gave it a word. And it's a, I think I counted 29 new words and phrases in the glossary, 29. There is one thing that I saved for last because uh, I think it's a bit controversial and I think that's something that a lot of Finnish comedians do. So now everybody's like, oh, they're going to put me down. Uh, <laughs> boom mic moments. What are boom mic moments? A boom mic moment in a podcast is to say, don't worry, we'll leave that in. Because <laughs> that makes the listener realize that you cut some stuff out. However, I don't know if you're going to say we'll leave that in because you might cut out the bit that says we'll leave that I'm in. I'm absolutely cutting all know. of that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. But my, but my point is, if if I say something and you said, oh, we'll leave that in, and I hear you say we'll leave that in at home listening to you, then I go, oh, some of it's been cut out. So this isn't a conversation. Now, you you might feel insulted now, because I don't know if you do that or not. I have only heard this in, in real time, right? But a boom mic moment is when the listener has an awareness of something that they may, should not be aware of. It makes them, takes them out of the moment. Now, a boom mic moment in comedy is when a comedian finishes a story and says, I did this story the other day in Sweden, and this guy shouted out this, and I said this. Now, it's great that the audience are laughing at that, but until you so I did this bit the other day, they're not thinking about it as being a bit you say again and again and again. They might know you do it again and again and again, but you, they don't need reminding of that. And and that's like the boom mic appears on the top of a screen during a film. You go, oh, it's acting. Oh, God, it's acting. You knew it was acting, but you forgot it was acting. So for me, there's to gain, there's no one or two laughs that are worth reminding your audience that everything you've just said has been said before the night before. Stuart Lee has deconstructed comedy to the point that the audience are holding the boom mic over his head for him. You want to do it in a meta way. If you're going to remind your audience you've done it, be aware. Here we are. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be aware of the effects. Because if your style is really conversational and you pour a heartfelt story about the day your mother died and at the end of it you say, I told this story the other day. It's like, you just took away the intimacy between you and your audience. Imagine having sex with someone and you put them in a position and they say, oh, this is my ex-boyfriend's favorite position. I don't want to know his favorite position. I don't want to know you slept with anyone else. I know you slept with other people. I don't want to hear about them now. In bed, can this be about us only? And there are better comedians than me that, that create boom mic moments. But personally, you know, walk on stage and say, oh yeah, I was going to do some new material tonight, but I, I think I'll just do the old stuff. Wow. The entire set is a boom mic now. Yeah, material. The word material. Yeah, are you thinking about this time you're enjoying these things you're hearing, these feelings you're feeling, are you thinking them as material? Yeah. If you tell jokes, if you tell 
constant one two line jokes i think the audience know this is this is your jokes these are your jokes it's it's certainly less damaging when a one liner comedian says i did this joke the other day this happened because they they're, they're your jokes but a story a routine with emotion in it don't remind us that all these emotions were were almost robotic because you're saying them the same every night i think it's very damaging when a very conversational comedian says I was doing this the other night because we've worked very hard to make the audience feel like they're just having a chat with you. So, but if, if a one liner comedian says, I did that joke there, yeah, that's another joke about the joke. Fine. And it's, your, I, I still, if I was a one liner comedian, I would still probably not tell the audience I've done that joke before because it still could be the joke that you wrote that day for them to hear. I'm not saying you should make your comedy look like it's improvised. I'm not saying you should make it look like you do a brand new set every night. I'm saying, let the audience be in the moment with you, hearing that joke, you and them, your moment. I think a one-liner comedian, so I did this joke the other day and get an extra laugh out of it, is a hundred times less damaging than a conversational comedian ending a story and then telling about the time they told the story. I don't want to hear about your other audiences without that. This is the thing. I don't mind hearing about, I don't mind hearing about other audiences if you want to talk to me as a comedian, opening up about your life. Don't tell us anything you said to a comedian that you've just said now. I think it is a almost a trope in Finnish comedy, and that's why I wanted to put it here as like this controversial opinion. Okay. That okay. So many people are doing this that yeah, I did this joke there and here and right. this happened and then this guy said and like again, when you put this concept into words, I realized that oh That's what was bothering me about what they were right, doing. Right, right, That's I think it's a thirteen-page chapter on that. That's how passionate I am about it. Now, I've got a way round. I'm going to give this is a free sample of the book. I'm going to show you a method I created. Ooh. I was writing for somebody who had a story where they really wanted to tell what the audience member said, and I said, "Look, I can't stand this, but you know, and I really want to do it." I said, "Okay." So I thought about it. I came up with a method of not creating a boom mic moment. Rather than doing the material and then telling this heckle afterwards, say, I got heckled in Sweden the other day. This is what happened. You then tell the story to us as it's you're repeating the story you told then, and then you get to the bit where they heckled and then they said this and da-da-da. That way, you're telling a story of the past. You're telling us this happened there. So it's not happening for the second time. You're not telling it to us and then breaking the magic by saying you've said it before. You're telling us what happened that night. The reason there's no boom mic moment is you're sharing a story about a heckle with the heckle in the story. So I got, so story, I did this the other day in Sweden, heckle, boom mic. The other day I got heckled in Sweden, here's what happened. I was telling this story about this. Then you go into the story and he said this, bang, there's no boom mic then. Someone could go, yeah, but you're still set, you're still saying it twice. Yeah, you're telling us about the time you said it. Big difference. It's, it's a massive difference. And now, if I hear people changing their stories to this format, I'm so happy that it, this small bit in a book or, well, even in this podcast has changed the Finnish comedy for the better. I can update the book anytime I want. If, if, I, if I spot a typo, I can update it. And then two hours later, the next book that's printed has the typo rectified. Ooh. But the, the last, yeah, it's great. The last change I made was I went to a comedian's party, it's an annual comedian's party in England, uh, and it was on Monday, just gone. And it's amazing. It's like 150 comedians in a room, four hours of drinking, and then goes on to a little late bar for the hardcore few of us. We're out, out till four in the morning, about 30 of us. But I walked into a room of 150 comedians, 95% I knew personally. It was amazing, amazing, beautiful. And no no partners are allowed. Promoters are allowed, but no partners. <laughs> and someone came up to me and said, oh, your boom mic moment. Um, you were saying about, you know, not mentioning being a comedian and or talking about other gigs you've done. And I, I was thinking, because I really like doing that. I said, no, no, I didn't say you can't talk about other gigs you've done. I said, don't talk about them until you've just done. You can talk about being a comedian all day. Just don't talk about the material you've just said. And he said, oh, okay, I'm really pleased to know that. And I realized he was the fourth person to say that because when I sit around these masterclasses, that's come up once at both the ones I've done in England. So I amended, for the first time, I amended an actual point. 
because all I've amended are typos. And this time, I reworded it clearer, and I put the point in bold. Maybe three times in the book, I put the whole sentence in bold, like, this really needs to be heard. I've done it three times, maybe four in the whole book, maybe even two. So what's good is I've, that from now on, when people buy it, uh, it hasn't been uploaded yet. It's going, it's going up probably tomorrow morning because I got to just check in for a few typos. You, do, you don't want to have, upload it every day. You know, I, I, if I, I check it um, and, I'll, and it's only been updated uh, four times. So this will be the fifth time. But this is the first update that actually has me rewording something because I really need people to know there's a difference between talking about a gig you did and talking about the material you've just done at another gig. They're completely different things. Oh, yeah. I didn't read it that way. I just read about, like, the material is the kryptonite that you should avoid. If you treat material like material, then it's, well, if you tell people your material is exactly that, and if you show people that your material is exactly that, that's how I read it. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're a character comedian, then the word material or the illusion, you should never allude to material Ever, if you're okay. if you go on stage as a bus driver and you talk about your life as a bus driver, you can't talk about another gig you did as a bus driver. You're not a, you're not a comedian, you're a bus driver. Or, or um, even worse, talk about your persona as bus driver, which would be a major <laughs> boom mic moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, but 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 there, there are so many. I mean, the, the boom mic moment where the comedian's ego comes in is a joke doesn't work, and then they say that line normally works. Oh yeah, that's not a pet peeve yeah. of mine. Like it's, That shit it, kills normally, but you're stupid. That's the implication. Nobody says you're stupid, but they yeah. imply it. You're telling the audience they're a bad audience, so you're insulting them and making drawing attention to the fact they're failing, and you're reminding them it's done, been done before, and all you're doing is protecting your ego. I want you to know that that joke normally works. The problem's not me here. I'm failing, but it's not me who's failing, because this joke normally works. That's only ego nothing but and at that moment you're making it worse for yourself you've reminded them the next thing you're going to say has been said before and you just told the audience they're not a good audience make a disclaimer make a joke about the joke not working not referencing it been said before and making the audience laugh at the fact they can laugh with you and this they finish i would imagine surely to make them laugh with you at your failure you know i've got loads of disclaimers loads of disclaimers and and i improvise disclaimers as well But when a joke doesn't work, you either ignore it or you make it funny. For Finnish audience, like the joy of misfortune is very much there. Like it's no coincidence that, well, there's no English word for Schadenfreude, which is German German word for yes, enjoying other people's misfortune. In Finnish, obviously, there's a word for that because, like, we enjoy absolutely love that. What's the word for it then? Vahingonilo. Uh, Oh, see, we got Schadenfreude. We had to use the German one. Yeah. Because we're nicer than you. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredibly nice to talk to you, and, and you were so kind to take part in this podcast. And this is uh, a podcast that's been listened to people who are all about the comedy writing. There are other podcasts that are about like the comedy lifestyle or the personas of the comedians. Those podcasts are doing that so well that I'm not going on that front. I'm basically going for like, okay, how do we write comedy and what what happens when you write comedy? For that reason, I believe that you were the best, absolute best guest that I could ever hope for for this podcast. So thank you so wow. much for wow. that. No, no, thank thank you too. I, I just want to say one thing on the subject of writing. 17 of the 32 chapters are about writing specifically and they're labeled. In the, in the table of contents. So if you're only interested in writing, you can go straight to them only. You don't have to listen to Boom Mic Moments. You know, if you're writing a sitcom or whatever, there's chapters on flow, there's chapters on trimming down jokes, there's chapters on generating new material, there's chapters on generating toppers, um, you know, punchlines on top of punchlines. That doesn't have to be stand-up. So the point is that I labeled the chapters on writing for two reasons. One, though, that new comedians who hadn't been on stage yet could just focus on that part at first, get their set together, Uh, and then go with the other stuff maybe once they've done a few gigs because it's very dense, right? So the and the other thing, I, I mean, you need a persona, but most of all, at the beginning, you need some material, right? At the beginning, of course, you want a persona first, but 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 it, realistically, that's not going to happen straight away. But the but the other reason I wrote the 17 chapters labeled for writing was so that writers could use it because you don't care. Writers don't care about boom like moments. Yeah. And and there's like other applications for all of this apart from like stand-up comedy because there's 
a lot of other type of joke writing that's very well served. For example, if I've done my fair share of writing jokes for TV and which is very far from stand-up comedy in terms of performance, but it's exactly there in terms of writing. But hey, it was incredibly nice uh, talking to you, uh, incredibly nice having you here, and the outcome of all of this, I strongly urge everybody to go on Amazon to get your book, and... uh, I, do you get it on all Amazons, or is it like UK and US only? Um, no, there's a there's I, I've seen Germany and um, Canada, and there's about when I get the the royalties, there's about twelve countries it mentions: Germany, Holland, Brazil, India. Yeah, I think Germany is the cheapest in terms of shipping, and it's in EU. So that's basically what we might want to suggest for people who are into this old-fashioned paper books and kindle why can't you buy on kindle anywhere i I think you can you can purchase for kindle from anywhere but when i purchase on my kindle it defaults to us for some reason uh fair enough fair enough it's nice to have on your phone on on kindle it's nice to have on your phone so you've got it everywhere everywhere you go yeah and i'm doing this like kindle reader which is 10 years old cheap thing and incredibly good that's the best 100 euros i've spent pretty much ever that's great that's great Yes, indeed. But hey, thank you so, so very much. No, no, no. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was Adam Bloom. His book, uh, Finding Your Comic Genius, as mentioned, is available on Amazon UK, US, Germany and elsewhere. I personally prefer the electronic Kindle version, but there's a paper version for all you old school folks out there. As is quite obvious to anyone who listened to this episode, I was just in awe of this book. It's not the easiest book to begin your comedy journey with, but still, if you have done some comedy writing, so you've succeeded and failed a couple of times, you will benefit from the book immensely. And I've been talking about this book with Finnish comedians, and all of them have been giving it glowing praise. Don't just take my or the other comedian's word. Check out the reviews we were talking about. I've got hundreds of books on my Goodreads account, and this one's got the best average reviews there are of all of those books. So I would say it's quite safe to say that it's not entirely horrible, right? Go on and get the book. I am not getting paid to say this, but I wish I was. So... This was the episode, but there's more. There will be more episodes in Finnish though. But please subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. But even better, if you want to support the podcast, please share a link to this episode on your social media. There's no Patreon. There are no paid subscriptions. I don't want your money. I want your love. This was Takaisin Kirjoituspöydälle, and I am Henri Lehto. See you again on the next episode.